television and so on okay uh, today we are going to okay we are we are continuing with our sermon series on the seven prophetic signs of jesus and uh, today we are going to talk about the first prophetic sign i did not go in the chronological order i went uh, i first uh, talked about uh, preached about the sixth prophetic sign then i spoke about the fourth and the fifth today we are going to talk about the first next sunday hopefully the second and third and june 14th we are finishing uh, off with the last but not the least that's the resurrection of lazarus from the dead and as i spoke to you i'm going to repeat it there were uh, in the book of john G, uh, john records through the inspiration of the holy spirit seven uh, miracles and the word miracle that he talks about is the word semi meaning a miracle with a message and uh, that miracle is otherwise uh, it's called a sign and these miracles that he performed was not just mere miracles but it had a message in it so starting from the first to the seventh and each of it complements one another and he writes in the book of uh, i mean in in john chapter 20 he writes in verse 30 and 31 that many signs and wonders did jesus perform uh, he, he says like and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of God and believing that you might have life through his name meaning that uh, it's not just a miracle or he's not just a miracle worker but he wants you to believe in him that he is the son of God because the final destination of all of us is to reach the gates of heaven okay uh, not to scrape through it but to reach the gates of heaven your li your life in this world is just temporary yes you need to have a healthy life here you need uh, those of you who have disabilities and disorders to be healed yes it is true but the final destination is to reach heaven and that is through believing that jesus is the son of god now he performed seven uh, uh, signs uh, in the book of john and john portrays Jesus as being the son of God just like Matthew portrays Jesus to be the <laughs> the king of kings Mark what does he portray Jesus as being the uh, God in flesh like that so each person has portrayed through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit Jesus being either son of God king of kings God in flesh Messiah and so on okay is that clear okay so so john has recorded these miracles but he says that he performed many other miracles but he has only recorded these seven in a chronological order because of the inspiration of the holy spirit we believe that the book is written through the inspiration of the holy spirit now the what was the first prophetic sign that was transforming water into wine i'm not going to discuss in detail because we're going to talk about it now the second prophetic sign was the healing of the nobleman's son which which was had a message in it which said that Jesus did not go to that man's house and touch and pray for him he did not do that he just gave the word okay meaning that the word of God from now on the word of God has power to transform somebody's faith from a superstitious faith into a saving faith because at the end of that story you will read that this man the noble man and his family was saved okay uh, this, uh, he, uh, definitely he got healed uh, the nobleman's son got healed but the final verse which is the most important was that the nobleman's son and the, and the nobleman and the whole family were saved 
So he talks about a message that the power, the word of God has power to transform you of faith into a saving faith. Okay. That is what's the importance in that. And third prophetic sign that Jesus showed was that uh, he heals a paralytic man. Okay. And if you read in the second story, Jesus starts off when the nobleman uh, comes and asks Jesus is, unless and until you see signs and wonders, you shall not believe. He says that. Okay. Why did he say that? Okay. We'll discuss about it next time. He was trying to give the importance of uh, he knows when you approach the throne of God that you are asking God for something for your own personal gain. Okay, so he wants to change your um, motive or your vision of thinking into believing that he is the son of God and to grow beyond the miracles. Okay, that is what's the whole concept in that story. That's I'm talking about the second. Now the third story is the healing of the paralytic man. What You will notice that Jesus goes there and there were many other sick people there. But he doesn't go to them. He only goes to this man. Okay. And he was sick for 38 years. And he heals him. Where he has a message in that miracle saying that we need Jesus. Because when we are born in this world, we are born in sin. And we need Jesus' strength to walk with God. Initially, we need Jesus' blood to wash us of all our sins. And we need his strength to walk with God. Because without Jesus, we are like that paralyzed man. Spiritually paralyzed. Okay, that's what we, where we get our strength from. Okay, that is what was talked about in that story. Hopefully, we will talk about it uh, in the uh, ne next Sunday. And the fourth prophetic sign that he uh, showed was feeding of the five thousand. And I talked about it already. He says, "I am the spiritual bread." Okay, you, you, each and every penny in your pocket belongs and is provided to you by God. Okay, He is able to multiply and feed you. Uh, of the little that you have but you need to seek after uh, the spiritual bread because that is what uh, he says after he performs that miracle that I am the bread of life I am the spiritual bread and I am the one who gives you abundant life okay and that's what he so talks about so he's talking actually that he shows that miracle and then people start following him and then he says I am the bread of life and despite say, uh, showing him showing them all these signs they ask him for another sign that's the sad part of it. They ask him for another sign. That's when he says, gives the importance. This is what is important. Not the physical bread, the spiritual bread. Okay. After that miracle is over, he goes and uh, walks on water. Now, why did Jesus walk on water? Was it to show off that he is God? No, it was trying to say that I walk with you during spiritual storms. And the water that can drown you, now it is under my feet. That was the prophetic message in that six, uh, fifth miracle. Fifth sign. The sixth sign was Jesus healing the blind man. Okay. Now when Jesus healed that blind man, he put clay in the eyes and then he told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means the sent one. Where he was trying to say that in this world, the clay symbolizes humanity. Okay. Because man was created from dust. And um, and he, um, God blew the spirit, uh, blew, blew, uh, blew his spirit into man and man became a living soul. Humanity or self-righteousness, self-confidence can uh, make your eyes blind. And when you wash in the pool of Siloam, which is the scent one, which is Jesus, and you wash off that clay, you start seeing God. You start seeing the kingdom. That was what is the whole message behind that. Because John 3.3 3 says, unless and until you become a born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So there is light all over. There is Holy Spirit all over. But if you do not have sight, can you see? No, you cannot see. So that is what he was trying to say in that particular message. And then he goes on to that blind man who, whose eyes were opened and he teaches him to see. So what I was trying to say through that sermon was that we need to teach people to see. Then only the altar call will be completed. Okay? You have to tell them that Jesus is the son of God. Teach them through the word. Be a testimony to them. Otherwise, there is light. They have vision. But they have to learn to see. Because you know a blind man when he gets a vision. It takes time for him to see. If you see in that video. If you notice that the blind man was trying to. Because he's for the first time seeing. He was born blind. Okay. So we teach people how to see. The kingdom. That was what is the importance. Now just by coming here. That is the starting point. You give your lives to the Lord. You become a born again believer. You, you need to be watered. The seeds have to be watered. Or else it will be uprooted. By the enemy. 
Okay? And the final, uh, last but not the least, was the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. Uh, where, he, uh, where Jesus says two things. He says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. I am the one who gives you the resurrection power, which Paul talks about, to, to resurrect you from your spiritual state, whether you're going lukewarm or whether you're backslided, back into the state he requires you to. And he says, I am the life. I am the one who gives you abundant life. Okay, so these were the seven prophetic signs. Today we are going to discuss about the first, very first prophetic sign. And before we discuss this prophetic sign, let me warn you that you have to be very attentive because this is a very highly prophetic uh, uh, story. I say prophetic because Jesus uses code words here. Basically, why we say code words is because Jesus was in the spirit and sometimes we are in the flesh. So when we read, we miss out some of those signals and riddles that he's putting there and uh, links that he's linking you up with. Okay, when you read the story, I will mention you where all he's talking. So be very attentive and listen to it because if you miss out one or two things, you cannot connect the dots. Okay, so let's go to John chapter 2 verses 1 and we'll read till 11. Okay, John chapter 2 verses 1 to 11. If you guys don't mind marking your Bibles, you can mark, otherwise you can leave it. Okay. And the third day. Okay. Starts off. And the third day. Why did the Holy Spirit put that third day? Okay. We'll discuss why. They don't say which month. It just says and the third day. Okay. So and the third day. You can mark third day if you want. There was a marriage. John 2. John chapter And the third day, there was a marriage in the Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage and when they wanted wine the mother of Jesus said unto him they have no wine Jesus said unto her woman what have I to do with thee my hour is not yet come let me just remind you that uh, the word woman there is not being disrespectful uh, it actually means dear lady Unfortunately, the English language has only very few words, and they have so it's translated as "dear lady." He was not being disrespectful by calling a woman. Okay, it sounds disrespectful, but he said, "Dear lady, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come." Today's message title is "My My Hour Is Not Yet Come." Why did Jesus say so? So, so, so for example, Mary is going and asking Jesus that there's no wine, and you get an answer like, "My hour is not yet come." Is it a specific answer he's giving here? No, this is some kind of prophetic language. We'll decode it. Okay, my hour is not yet come. His mother said unto the servants, it's not like she understood what he's trying to say. She said like, whatever he says unto you, do it. Okay. And there were, there was a set there, six water pots. If you don't mind marking that, just mark six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water and they fill them up to the brim. So just note that brim, up to the brim. And he said unto them, draw not, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that, had, that was made wine, he and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then what then which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. The beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Not believed him, huh? believed on him. Okay. So they were still seeing him as a miracle worker, uh, not yet believing to the extent of that he is God. Okay, This believed on him, some kind of miracle worker who is doing some kind of miracles supernaturally. Now, let's go first. Uh, I want to discuss is the setting of the miracle. Okay, So this was setting of the miracle was, it was a marriage. Okay, It was a wedding that was taking place uh, in at that point. And in this wedding that was taking place, there was a problem. What was the problem? There was no wine. Okay. Now, so now, uh, what I want you to notice is two things here. Third day, my hour has not yet come. Okay. So we're going to connect this. Third day, my hour has not yet come. Okay. So now, uh, what is the third day? Okay. 
If you remember 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 8, uh, uh, Peter says one day is equivalent to, I mean one day for God is equivalent to 1000 years for God. Okay, So two days is equivalent to 2000 years for God. What does this signify? Okay, What does it signify is two days, uh, 2000 years actually of man's history is over and we are standing in the threshold of the third day, that is the 3000th year for man uh, in history where his glory is going to be manifested. Is that, uh, do you guys understand that? I'll explain it to you in detail. For you guys to understand, and believe me, God is complicated. If you think about him in the flesh, you have to think about him in the spirit. There are two times that God has, okay? One is the Kairos time, which is God's appointed time, okay? God's appointed time. The other one is the Kronos time, okay? Which is the chronological time, okay? Chronological time. From where you get the word Kronos. Uh, in, in the book of Genesis, we all were created. If you didn't know that. We all were created in the Kairos time. Okay, But you got to go in the chronological time. That on, on the day of 26 September 1975, I was supposed to be born. Okay, 26 September 19, but I was already created. My spirit was created. Okay, And then God connects. Now... What he is doing is he's linking this wedding with another wedding. If you guys know which that wedding is, is how many weddings are recorded in the Bible? Any wedding you know which is recorded in the New Testament? If anybody answers, I'll give them ten kocha. <laughs> Do you know of any wedding in Revelation chapter 19 verse 9? Which wedding is that? Huh? Okay, it says the uh, marriage and supper of the Lamb. This wedding is actually connected to that wedding. That's a prophetic link there. Okay, so now what he's saying is, on the third day, the threshold of that day, uh, this wedding is taking place. It is actually the Holy Spirit has put there, third day, he didn't have to do that. He's put there to link you with that wedding there. That is why Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. What was he talking about? His death? No. When Mary goes and asks for wine, he says, my hour has not yet come. Okay, now read Revelation 19.9. You will see that he talks about the marriage of the supper of the Lamb. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have studied through the book of Revelation. Let me just quickly just summarize what is going on in the book of Revelation. Okay. In the book of Revelation, there are three parts to it. Okay. The first chapter talks about Jesus Christ. That is the first advent of Jesus. Okay. Who is Jesus? Okay. So that is what had happened okay in the past then he talks uh, from revelation 2 to 3 on what is happening the church age seven letters to the seven churches i, I don't think so much of you have read it uh, the se okay and then he talks about what is going to come revelation chapter 4 talks about rapture okay because it says in that john suddenly was taken up okay then he starts talking about trumpets then he goes on goes on goes on and he starts talking about four horsemen coming in okay and first horseman is white, that is not Christ, as Christ, that is Antichrist. Because the word Antichrist means, let me take my time for this, Antichrist means as Christ or against Christ. It has two meanings to it, okay? So this person is going to portray himself as Christ. So that, that's when the tribulation has begun. Now, there's a lot of controversies regarding this pre-tribulation and mid-tribulation. I don't have time to talk about it now. It's just a, a confusion between two words, tribulation and wrath, okay? That's what is happening there. Now, then the tribulation takes place, okay? The four horsemen, then they talk about trumpets, then they talk about plagues. Do you remember? Now, this plague is a mirror image of the plague in the book of Exodus, actually. Both are complementing one another. It's just a dress rehearsal there. It's happening there in the next. And then finally, before he, when he comes with the rapture, Jesus doesn't step on the ground. Isaiah talks about it. When he comes, he doesn't step on the ground. Isaiah, prophet Isaiah prophesies that Jesus in the first advent will come as a suffering Messiah. Something which the Jews missed out. Then he says when he comes in the second time, he comes as a prosperous Messiah, glorious Messiah. The Jews took the glorious Messiah, the prosperous Messiah as the one for the first advent. So they said this man cannot be the Messiah because he's supposed to come in the clouds. They got confused there. Okay. Now, let me just tell this. Uh, so, first time when he comes, he doesn't step on the ground. But the second time he's going to come, he's going to come with the saints. That is us. 
I hope you guys are there. <laughs> now, uh, when he comes with us, uh, before he's going to come, okay, just before he's going to come, that is in somewhere around Revelation 20, 19th chapter, he does the marriage supper of the Lamb. Why does he do that? He's just confirming the covenant. Okay, he is going to show the world that he had a covenant with the church and he's confirming the covenant. If you have breaking of the bread and wine, that is just a dress rehearsal for that day. Now this wedding, now we come to this wedding, is linked to that wedding. Okay, that is why he says my hour is not yet come. He didn't talk about him dying on the cross. He said that time is not yet come. Now, when, when somebody, when Mary is going to Jesus and asking, there's no wine. And if you receive an answer like, my hour has not yet come, does it make sense? Because if you are in the flesh mode, you don't, it doesn't make sense. You have to be in the spirit mode. You have your prophetic ears open. Now, I'm sure, pretty sure Mary did not understand what's going on. Okay. And it is not by her flesh that she told the servants, do whatever he says, uh, tells you to do. It is by the spirit that she tells them, do whatever he's going to do. Because he never told he never told Mary that he's going to turn the water into wine. Okay, so it is by the spirit that Mary says, do whatever he said, tells you to do. Okay, so did he get the setting of the miracle? I hope you guys are clear. If you know, uh, to an extent, the book of Revelation, you will understand what I'm talking about. If you have, you heard marriage of the supper of the lamb, maybe one or two times somebody has preached. I would be taking uh, the book of Revelation series, but I cannot take it continuously for Sundays, so it might be broken up into pieces. For, before which we can compile all of that. It's very important to know the book of Revelation because it is written in the only book in the Bible which it is written. If you read it, you will be blessed. Okay? Now, why? so that is the reason why I hope this is clear for you why he said my hour has not yet come. Okay? So he's talking about that. That's the setting of the miracle that you have to understand. Sixth, uh, third day sing, uh, signifies the dispensation time where Jesus' glory is going to be manifested. And here it's written in the verse 11, his glory was manifested. And that is why he says, my, my hour has not yet come. So you guys understood that prophetic language there. Okay? Alright. Uh, what I want you to see, the next part is that... Um, um, uh, is, is the symbolism in the, of the miracle. There's a lot of symbolism in this miracle, okay? Now let's start off with thinking what does wine here symbolize, okay? Wine in the Bible symbolizes joy. If you didn't know, you can read uh, Psalms 104 verse 15. It says, And wine that make glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. Is that clear? Okay, now, Please do understand this wine, as many people argue, is not intoxicating wine. It's, it's not fermenting wine. Did you guys get it? Why? Okay, read Proverbs 23, 31 to 32. It says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth this color in the cup, and when it moveth itself aright, meaning that when it, when it starts intoxicating you. At the last it biteth like a serpent and sting like an adder. Do you read that? Should I repeat it? Proverbs 23, 31 to 32. There are many, many, many traditional Christians who argue that Jesus turned water into wine. So what is wrong in drinking wine? Uh, well, it says in this, Jesus never transformed water into an intoxicating uh, serpent uh, which bite. It's given in the book of Proverbs. Okay, So it, uh, it was basically not non-fermented grape juice, what he's talking about over there. And here he talks about the uh, the wine being uh, the one which makes your heart joyful. Okay, uh, some kind of sparkling grape juice. Okay, he's talking about now because intoxication is not the substitute of Jesus. That he does it's Jesus joy. Here he's talking about the joy of uh, Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you that there's a difference between happiness and joy. Joy. Okay, happiness is happy. Uh, good happenings make you happy. Okay, joy is coming from Jesus, okay, which is an inside, uh, inside hope, an inside, uh, not a feeling, I would say, uh, an assurance that you have. Say, for example, you, um, you, you, you are, uh, uh, you have a tragedy in your house, you lose your uh, close relative, that makes you sad, but it doesn't steal your joy, okay, you still have the joy of salvation in you, which will never go. Okay, the second symbolic sign of wine there is, it uh, signifies, symbolizes the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, now you remember, he says, he tells them to fill the earthen vessels with up to the brim. Okay, here the earthen vessel symbolizes man. 
Okay, and why why six earthen vessels? Because I told you before the number six is the number for man. Okay, so there's six earthen vessels, and he says fill it up to the brim, which symbolizes. Uh, you remember Jesus saying, "I did not come to take away the law, but I came to fulfill the law." So that's what it's symbolizing there. Now, these six filled earthen vessels symbolizes religion, ritualism of man. Is it clear? Religion, ritualism of man. The Jews were ritualistic in their beliefs. They were very legalistic in their beliefs. Okay? And now Jesus is tell, telling them that it is time for you to change from your ritualistic beliefs and a new covenant is coming. This water will be transformed now into wine which is, uh, the, which is my blood which will protect you from the condemnation of the law because the law was given to you to expose your sin. Now my blood of the new covenant is going to uh, protect you from the condemnation of law. Is that clear? Okay. Now, where did they take out the water from? From the vessels? No. They did not. Because you see the word draw over there. They drew it from the well. Those six earthen vessels, pots, were there. Uh, what he's trying to tell you is, you have to now leave it aside. Okay. Those six earthen vessels should be left there okay and now I'm, you, you're going to draw you're going to draw the the wine of joy from my well which gives you abundant life okay which is the wine which gives you abundant life i have come here now to give you abundant life draw it from that well which is in abundance okay you guys are looking shell shocked <laughs> all right so now he what he does is he's transforming water into wine a lot of prophetic thing in this now. Okay, there's a lot of coded uh, languages here he's using. And then he says, uh, uh, what is God? Is God is a basically in the, and Jesus is in the transformation business, I would say. Uh, not that he's a transformer who will turn into a plane or, or a car. No, not that. <laughs> he's a transformer of the soul. Because the greatest miracle that you can encounter is your transformation of your soul. He transformed Peter, who was a big mouth Peter, into a, a, a blasphemer, into a flaming apostle of the Pentecost. Okay, John had a short temper. He was uh, uh, nicknamed, what was his nickname? Son, son of Thunder. And he was transformed into uh, the, uh, the apostle of love. Okay, and uh, uh, Mary was, the, was a harlot and she was uh, transformed into the herald of the resurrection. She was the one who went to the grave. Now, uh, I was a person who was so scared to even talk in public and I had a phobia and I, I absolutely knew nothing from the word of God. And uh, when the prophet, uh, a, a youth pastor of mine, came and said, prophesied that this man is going to go to Africa to preach the word, uh, everybody's jaws there dropped. This fellow doesn't know anything from the Bible. He doesn't know even the basics. Don't you want to go to the Bible college? I said, no, I'm just going to listen to what he says, uh, uh, and I'm just going to set off to Africa. So before I went to Africa, many of my friends came to the house, Christian friends, and uh, they said, you know, I think you really need to go to a Bible college and, uh, you know, you really need to, how are you going to do this, you know? it's Now, uh, I have not gone to any Bible college and I just had a, a spiritual mentor and his uh, name is the Holy Spirit. We depend on the Holy Spirit and uh, uh, that was the theological uh, seminary I went to. And uh, God spoke to me. Yes, I have spiritual mentors in my life. Some of them are late. One of them is Dr. Adrian Rogers. He was a he was an amazing preacher. I do listen to people. Yes, I do water myself. You can't just simply sit there. You, uh, I do listen to a lot of online radio sermons and preachings and teachings and do my own research. You know what is the school of thought this side? What is the school of thought? I just don't go following one. And then of course you have to sit in the presence of God and God does speak to you and you hear His voice. And that's how I am standing now. And uh, some of them who listen to the preachers just amazed uh, what God has done in my life. And I'm uh, blessed. And uh, uh, people are hearing the sermons around the world now. Uh, broadcasted on the television. All glory goes to God. He's just using ordinary people to do extraordinary work. He doesn't like... Uh, to use uh, learned men. So if you guys are highly educated, uh, know that um, you may be in trouble. <laughs> God may use ordinary. Okay? So get it out of your head. God, God only likes to use ordinary fishermen from Galilee to, do, uh, to become flaming apostles for him. 
Okay, so if you are coming from a background, uh, the apostle in my church in India who has uh, gone to more than uh, 50 countries uh, had only studied up to 6th grade and he was uh, preaching in New York to people in his language and they were translating. Okay, so God can do extraordinary So he is in the transformation business. I, I was very scared to speak in public and uh, uh, it's only because of God that he has transformed me and he's continuing to transform. So that is what he's doing with transforming the water into wine he's talking about. Okay, you are just uh, an earthen vessel uh, filled was just signifying ritualism. Come out of it. Now there's a new covenant, a well of joy from which he transforms. Okay, now um, uh, let me just, uh, yeah. I told you that the servants drew it from the well. Now we look at the secret of the miracle. Okay, what Mary says. Mary says, whatever he tells you to do, you need to do. Okay, so now you uh, understand that basically he's talking about the obedience, to be obedient to Christ. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, you just do it. Sometimes you go to Jesus asking for something. Like for example, um, uh, you, you may go to Jesus in your prayer and ask him, God, I'm, I'm tired of my uh, this job. Can you give me a promotion in my job? The answer that you receive from him will be, you can, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, he says you are comfortable and you stay there because Jesus knows that you need to stay there for a couple of pe period before you can receive your promotion because when you receive that promotion you will give the 100% glory to God than which, which you will get now. That is why he waited till Lazarus was dead because the fullest of time has to come. So what I'm trying to say is when you go, uh, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. Don't rebel against him and try to uh, go for not the perfect will of God but the permissive will of God. Don't do that. Okay. Yes, you have to be persuasive in your prayers, but uh, know how to discern that. The timing of God is very important. And uh, it's very interesting in this particular story. The other secret which I find is that not only did it bring gladness to the people who obeyed, it also brought uh, it, it was for the good of the servants and it also brought gladness to others. When we serve God, when we are obedient to Jesus, we don't realize that it doesn't bring goodness to ourselves, but it also becomes a blessing for others. And it, the third thing is that it also gives glory to God. Now there's one thing that is they talk about, the master of the ceremony of that marriage or wedding did not know, but the servants knew from where they had drawn water. Did you read that? You remember? He says the servants knew, but the, you have to be in that inner circle with God. You have to be in that inner circle with God where the servants know things that the others don't know. The servant in your house or the maid in your house knows what is happening in your house but not your neighbors. The servant in the state house knows what's happening in the state house, not the others. Okay, there are certain things which God reveals to uh, his servants when you are in that inner circle. But then he takes you one step further. In John 10.10 10, he says, I have not called you servant but I have called you now friend. Let's read that. John, sorry, 1515. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant not, not what his Lord do, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. So he takes you a step further and then you need to move further from the step of just being a servant of God and be a friend of God. Okay, where you will know all things. So uh, it is important to be in that inner circle with God. That is what it's symbolizing there. And just for you to note down, you can write on the side, Amos chapter 3 verses 7. It reads, surely, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealed his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Okay? So he reveals secrets to the servant. And then he, after servant, he says the prophets. Okay? When you become uh, friends with God, you, you can receive revelations, secrets from God. Uh, to who, whose ears are prophetically inclined, or ears, prophetic ears are open. Okay, so that was what was the, the secret of that uh, particular sign that Jesus performed. Now we come to the last phase is the sequel of the sign. So I want you to read the, uh, what this man says, uh, uh, the master of the ceremony, or the governor of the feast. He says, uh, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made man, made wine and knew not whence it was the servants which drew the water knew the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him every man at the beginning do set forth good wine and when man have well drunk then that which is worse but thou hast kept the good wine until now 
Okay. You know what is uh, with God's characteristics is one thing you have to know about God is uh, he talks about it in Isaiah and uh, Jeremiah. He gives you the best, the last. Okay. What does the devil do? He gives you the best first. Okay. There was this patient who was admitted uh, in a hospital and a uh, few days back he passed away. Uh, this man, uh, this boy was an uh, 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 amazing soccer player and uh, of course he was from an Indian origin. Uh, I'm not giving you the, much of details. So he was goofing around, playing around and uh, sleeping around and uh, you know the devil was giving him the best in the beginning. I, I would say best in the eyes of the world. And uh, he said life is short. Uh, you've got to enjoy, you know, those things of the world, those uh, yo-yo people say, I know life is short, it's cool, let's, let's enjoy it, let's, you know, have fun. And then he ended up, you know, uh, getting infected and he came up to us and then I, I, we had to reveal to him that he's infected and he needs to take the medicine. But he was in that denial phase, no, this cannot happen to me, he did not take the medicine, then it got worse. And finally, I really... Uh, uh, the way he died was terrible. It's the worst death you can ever have. And uh, when I went up to his uh, room, uh, in the end he said, please disconnect everything, I just want to die. And you can see that regret in his face and how he finally died was really a uh, terrible uh, incident. You, you can see that regret in his face. This is what the devil does. He lies to you. And he tries to give you the best in your eyes of deception that that is the best and then uh, the ending is always going to be very bad. Uh, not to scare you guys, just remember God may take you through hurdles, obstacles, uh, storms in your life, tribulations. He said, uh, be of good cheer for I have overcome that. You go through all that because God wants to give you the best and the fullest of time so that you give 100% glory to God and you realize the importance of it. So in the book of Isaiah, he says, my thoughts are just like the heavens are above the earth, my thoughts are way above for a good end to it. So what is basically this man is talking in the wedding ceremony is again, uh, what he's trying to say is Jesus gives you the best in the end. And um, you may go through a lot of troubles right now. You may be going through it, but know that everything happens with God permits it to happen. Uh, and uh, some of the problems that you face, yes, it may be due to your faults, but you need to realize, get convicted, ask God for forgiveness, but he's still in control. But always your ending is going to be a happy story. It's not going to be a disastrous end uh, or, 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 you know, a terrible end for that. That was the sequel of this whole miracle. What was he trying to say was, I am that well from where you draw your joy and you receive your joy from and this wine is the blood is my blood that will protect you from the condemnation of the law and this wedding is prophetically linked and connected to the uh, wedding in revelation 19 9 there are so many links in the bible i'll just tell you another link that was the tower of nimrod okay where the people's tongue were confused it's did you know that it was prophetically linked to acts chapter 2 120 gathered in the upper room. There, this guy's tongue, their tongues were confused. There, they had uh, uh, come together to uh, uh, come together to build a tower up to heaven. It's not that they were building a tower up to heaven. No, no that's not what they were doing. There was going to be a, you know, um, we call it an obelisk, a pillar like this, with a hole in uh, in in the center. And it was uh, astrology that they were, uh, the religion of astrology uh, and it, its origin took place in that Nimrod's tower, okay? And uh, so they wanted to look into the stars and learn the position of the stars and uh, bring in, uh, worship that kind of religion of astronomy. Astrology, sorry, not astronomy. Astronomy and astrology are related and linked. And uh, God confused their tongues. But when the 120 gathered in the day of Pentecost, I'm just giving an example of prophetic links. When they gathered in the uh, 100, they, they were given an ability. The word tongues, there is glossolalia, to speak in other languages. Now, he did not confuse their language, but he gave them an ability to speak in another language. Okay, So that is pro actually a prophetic link. Uh, so you should be able to discern and understand and I am grateful to God and I thank God for giving me this revelation and I'm so super excited to just give it to you. Okay, even if people haven't come, I know uh, not all of them have come, but I know that it will be uh, broadcasted in the television and it's coming as a series and uh, many people uh, have uh, 
send back good uh, reports and I am happy not because of myself receiving it because what God is doing through me and I am always willing to and ready to be used by God even if I have to go through a storm I take it as a challenge I take it as a food uh, to be fed with to make me more strong so let me just tell you this one thing that uh, you know that Jesus is that source of well of joy where you receive that uh, spiritual strength from and the joy that that can never be taken off from you this is the joy of salvation I'm talking about not happiness happiness is when good things happen you are uh, you're happy when sad things happen you are sad but let us look for that joy of salvation that will make your heart jump up with a joy when you drink from his banquet table and uh, reconfirm all we do is dress rehearsals let's do that and I hope all of you will be there in that marriage of the supper of the Lamb